Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. My name's David. I was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. Chose Judah as leader, and from the tribe of Judah, he chose my family. And from my father's sons, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. declared to me through the prophet. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. So now, I charge you in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God. Be careful to follow all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as in inheritance to your descendants forever. And I instructed Solomon my son and pled to those who came after to acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And these are the sons of David, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promise so that your name will be great forever. I am King Jehoshaphat. I loved the Lord my God. I tried. I tried to be faithful. I taught the people about him. I wasn't perfect. That Ahab is so convincing. But when the Lord rebuked me, I listened. I loved him. I loved the Lord my God. Well, good morning. My name is Bob. I am Eric's brother. That is not true, but every single time I hang around Eric, since I've known him since seminary, um, people eventually will ask, are you guys related? Like they do that every, and last week it did not fail, not one, but two people say, are, are you his brother? And I always anymore just say, yeah, I'm his younger, more attractive brother. So that's what I tell people. 
I am glad to be here. We were talking about the kings of Judah last week. We talked about a king named Asa and plan A and plan B. And today we're talking about a king named Jehoshaphat, a, a man with really a unique name. We've all giggled at that name at some point or other. Uh, any future parents out there, my advice is just don't name your child Jehoshaphat because they didn't have junior high in ancient Israel. It would, it would be rough. And Jehoshaphat has a very unique name. And he even has a more unique story. He did something truly unique. And the reason it sticks out to me, what he does, and why I think it's so unique, is because there was a theory I developed, a hypothesis, and it was a couple years ago I developed this hypothesis, and it's about faith. And and I came to realize that a person who has true faith or true belief, whether it's God or, or just whatever they say, it is when your stated theology matches your functional theology. What I mean by that is when the things that you say and state, I believe this, whatever it may be, has to match the function, when the rubber meets the road, when you have to live it out. When the person who is forced to live out what they say, that is a person who has great faith, great conviction. Hopefully some of that makes sense. Let me explain and just take it down a level and and tell you how I got to that point, that hypothesis. And it was when I traveled to Florida, um, every year with my family, different parts of my family. My grandma lives there uh, with a, a lot of other grandma. We always call it Heaven's Waiting Room in Florida. Uh, it's not nice, but it is. My family's really awesome, very outgoing, and we decide we're going skydiving. Not grandma, not a couple people. And, and I started talking to my wife, who was seven months pregnant at the time. And fellas in here, some words of advice. Just don't, don't go skydiving if your wife's pregnant at all. And... Um, She's not going, but I'm trying to tell her, now. there's nothing to worry about. It's okay. I'll be okay. No, I'm not, not anxious. Don't worry. And she agrees. Yeah, you could go ahead and go. And I go with my sisters and the brother-in-law. And we get to, it's like backwoods Florida, which is kind of sketchy. And you don't want that in a skydiving place, right? And we show up, sign waivers, and they give me a suit and, and uh, goggles and that altimeter watch where you can see how high you are. And then a helmet. And I thought, that's weird. What's this going to do if I fall out of the sky at 10,000 feet? Not a lot. But they gave me a helmet, and they clip, and they, and they go through training. I'm thinking, okay, training will help. They clip you in the first time you go with another guy. It's called Tandem. And uh, the training literally was about a minute. <laughs> and the training went something like this. Just kick your feet back when you jump. <laughs> literally, that's what it was. And I'm like, okay, I can, I can do that. So... I, I get, and the plane pulls up, and then I start getting a little more worried, because it looked really sketchy, like the one Charles Lindbergh flew, the Spirit of St. Louis, <laughs> 1920s, that one, that's what it looked like, and it, any plane over 10,000 feet has to have oxygen, and it had a piece of PBC with holes drilled into it, attached to a tiny little oxygen tank, and so I'm in this plane, and it's just, and I'm thinking, and uh, we keep getting higher and higher and higher. And I look at my watch, and I make the mistake of looking out the window, and I start flipping out inside. And I look again at my watch, and I'm at 7,000 feet. We have to go to 14. I'm only halfway, and all of a sudden, through my mind, all these thoughts, what if, Right? Anybody in there? What if the parachute doesn't open? What if this plane doesn't make it? And then I started thinking about, like, this guy I'm attached to is kind of old. What if he has a heart attack? And I'm, like, standing in heaven, and Peter's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm with him, you know? <laughs> that's, that's what's going on. And there's all these what ifs, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, the things that I said to my wife, it'll be fine. I'm not worried. I'm not scared. No, don't worry about it. All of a sudden the things that I stated did not match the function. Does that make sense? It did not match it at all. For somebody to truly believe something, what you say has to match the function when you have to live it out. Rubber meets the road, so to speak. And we've all had this, experienced it, whether big or small, faith or not. Like somebody says, do you trust me? And you say, of course. And then they say, well, come do this. And then you say, no, <laughs> oh, no. Why? Because oh, I might have said I trust you, but honestly, I, I don't really trust you, right? Or... Uh, husbands in here ever heard this? Oh, it's fine. Go ahead and go. Right? My wife said that to me when I went skydiving. 
truth was, when I got home, what happened was she was ang- she was madder than a hornet. She was hot because she had time to think about it. And she started saying, what if you would have died? I would have been a widow. What if you would have got hurt? And then I would have taken care. I would have just put you in a nursing home. Things like that. This is the conversations <laughs> were going on. And so we've heard people say, it's fine. It's okay. But then when you get to think about it more and more, it wasn't fine. It wasn't okay. And maybe it's not that. Maybe it's like things of faith. We've experienced that where we tell people who are going through something difficult, you know, this, this produces perseverance and strength. And, and, and don't worry, God's going to, to strengthen your faith. You'll be somebody different. But then you go through that same thing. And for you, it's hard to rely on those words you told people. It's hard for you in that position, right, to, to, to embrace this and say, this will be something. That re- you just want to get out of it. See, in different ways, we've all experienced this. The measure of true faith is when your stated theology matches the function. That's my hypothesis that I uh, I developed. And the reason I found King Jehoshaphat so amazing is he said something, and he really believed it. He believed it so much, he lived it out in a crazy way. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The thing that he does, the, the, uh, he does and what he believes. And, and the truth is, he believed this simple thought. He believed that God was for us. And then he lives it out in just this remarkable fashion. And the story of Jehoshaphat is found in Chronicles, uh, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 17. And the story is that all the kings of Judah are there, and they just start. There's no background. It just said, Jehoshaphat, as his son, succeeded him, which would be Asa, as a king, and he strengthened himself against all Israel, and he stationed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and put garrisons in the town of Judah and the towns of Ephraim and his father Asa. So the writers are doing something to show us this is a man who has incredible strength. And you'll see this over and over in one chapter. Every town, every place that the edges of his border, he started putting forts and fortifying them with people and supplies so no one could attack him. And it said the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, but sought God his father and followed the commands rather than the practices. And then the Lord established the kingdom under his control. And all of Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat so he had great wealth and honor. So even the people are recognizing how great a king he is. And this is one of the few kings you see this happening. People bring him gifts to say, you are a great powerful man. And it says his heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles. Now at this time, you see him being strengthened, strengthening the outside, but also strengthening their faith. He gets re- and removes all the gods. There, There's no Google at this point in this time. And so no one knew exactly how everything worked. So it was attributed to a lot of the gods. And there were a lot that you worship, make sure you were on the right side, rain, whatever it may be, floods, things like that. It was from the gods. And so there are a lot of different gods in this culture in this time people worship. And um, these Israelite people believed that there was only one. They were monotheists. His name was Yahweh. And a, a good monotheist would get rid of all the other gods. Um, and this is what he does. And In fact, one of the uh, most popular was this god here. They still are digging up statues with him. His name is uh, Baal. He was considered the god of fertility, rode on the clouds. He made it rain. And these were, a lot of them were farmers, sustenance farmers t- to survive. So you often worship this god to make sure that you could eat and live. And he even removes him. And the other most popular god was Asherah, removes that pole. So you see like this internal strength and strengthening of this empire. And then it says this, that the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land surrounding Judah, so they did not go to war against Jehoshaphat. Some Philistines brought Jehoshaphat gifts and silver as tribute, and the Arabs bought him 7,700 rams and 7,700 goats. And this is the first time I've ever seen this in all of Scripture when I was reading it. Their arch nemesis is a group called the Philistines. Like, if you're a Michigan fan, it's like Ohio State. That guy walks in with all the gear times 10. And they lived right here around the corner of Judah. And they're at constant battle and war. You've heard of giants from there. From the time of Abraham to the exile in Scripture, you can see them at battle with this group of people. And in this time, he is so strong that the Philistines come to him and offer him gifts. And the surrounding nations are afraid to invade and attack him. Suddenly you see this is a man, not only his own people are offering him gifts, 
all the nations, including his arch nemesis, are doing the same because he is a bad man. And it's interesting, they keep going to explain how powerful he is. Said Josahat became more powerful, and he built forts and store cities in Judah, and he kept experienced fighting men in Jerusalem, and the enrollment was as followed. And you can see all these numbers right here. Uh, th- these are his generals and the numbers and numbers. And I'm going to just kind of skip through it quickly because you can't ignore this. But here's what I want you to see. What, what was explained in that verse was that there was a general named Adna who had 300,000. Jehonanan, 280. Amaziah, 200. Elida, Jehozabad, 180,000. All these people. He had 1.16 million people in a standing army, not to mention, it says, the people that lived in the fortified parts of this empire. 1.2 million people. This is the largest army in all of Chronicles. This is larger than all the other kings combined yet. If you want to compare that to today, there are 1.4 million people in our armed services. This is a big army. In fact, at this time, if you would keep reading, the people from Israel to the north, the other kingdom, they started coming down and living in Judah because they felt more secure there. The writers are helping us see how strong this king is and good this king is over and over and over again. Then something interesting happens. A chapter later, After explaining his strength, it says, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Menubites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. And some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already at Hazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarm, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. And the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So there's this group of nations that come essentially from this corner and they come around the Dead Sea to this place called En Gedi, which is actually a desert oasis. It's still there. Beautiful. You could visit it. And so these people are coming and it says he's alarmed. Now the word in Hebrew, alarmed, every single time you see alarmed, it means to fear. I don't know why it's translated alarmed. He was afraid. He was so afraid, he decides to fast. Not just him, he calls all the people in his entire nation, tells them we have to fast. Now, you fasted, you would not eat food, and this idea has developed throughout Scripture. But at this point, the reason you would fast was either in mourning, or number two, you would fast because you needed to get God's attention. And so you're fasting and praying to get God's attention. So he calls a fast for everyone because they need God's help, which tells me one thing. This must be a really big army. Because if you have 1.2 million people in your army and 10,000 people come at you and they're on your land, they're trying to get to Jerusalem, are you worried? No. They have 50,000. Are you worried? No. How big must have this force been for him to humble himself and say, we have to pray, must have been something significant. And then the story goes, and it continues, and it says, all the men with their wives and children stood before the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah. And he stood in the assembly. And the way the Spirit works, we talked about it last week. In the Old Testament, it would come upon one person like a prophet, speak to them. That person would take that message to the rest of the people. And he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the desert gorge in the desert of Jeruel, and you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you in Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord, he'll be with you. And it's fascinating. He's told three things. Don't worry. Number two, 
The battle is God's. Number three, go here. This is kind of, you can still walk through the paths of ziz, of what it looks like, sort of the pass here. So he says to him, go out there, take your army there, meet them there. And it would be really honest about what he said. Meet them there. It doesn't give him any other details what to do. Don't worry. The battle is yours. And so it says, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa, and they set out, and Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. So he's giving them this pep talk. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets. You will be successful. And this is where it gets really interesting. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed the men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the what of the army? The what? The head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And it was then and there. It's easy to read past that. I stopped and I said, wait, what? He did what? He pointed some people to sing at the front of the army? What's he doing? Well, in this time, at this time, there was a group of people who took care of the temple. They were called the Levites. And David had set this up before all these other kings. And one small group of the people, of the Levites, uh, Levites were to be the people who sang, who worshipped. Um, you can see it. It said, when David was old and full of years, he made his son Solomon king. He gathered all the people, the Levites, 30 years or older. They were counted. There were a number of 38,000 of them. And then it said, 24,000 would be in charge of the work of the temple of the Lord. 6,000 would be officials and judges. 4,000 would be gatekeepers. 4,000 are to praise the Lord with the musical instruments I have provided for him for that purpose. And so... Jehoshaphat says, all right, take the 4,000 people. And just imagine that for a second. Justin, a band of 4,000 people. How awesome. Eat your heart out. You would never have to worry about filling like a spot if you had 4,000 people. And he says, take those 4,000 people and put them at the head of the army. And it's easy to read by that. It's easy actually to read ourselves out and read it from the past or from 30,000 feet or get kind of pious. Of course, God said he would. But I started thinking about it. And I thought, that is weird. Like, who in the right mind would, like, send the marching band out? (laughs) Right? And then I started thinking about how often I can read myself out. And and what I wanted to do, just for a second, just imagine with me you're one of the 4,000. And you're one of those 4,000 worship players, and you play this, the melodica, right? (laughs) Something like that. The instrument every child wants to play. That, that is your job to do that. And the king comes to you and he says, I need you to go to war. And you're thinking, okay, you, you want me to like play something, like pump them up? I can do that. Like as they go out, we'll do that. It's like, no, no, I, I want you to go out to war with the armies. And you're thinking, oh, well, Okay, I, I play a melodica, but I, I could do this. I'll just play some background music, like something like that as they're going out, pump them. No, 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 we don't, we don't want, we actually want you to lead the army. And you're standing there and you're looking, I guess I could put this down. I mean, uh, I'll go get a sword or something. And the king says, no, no, we want you to take the melodica with you. And you're standing there and you say, don't you literally have a million other people that can do this? Have you talked with somebody about this king? I'm not sure. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked with a couple guys. We think it's cool. We're going to send you out. Don't worry. God's for us. Don't you think there was one of these people, one of the 4,000 who said, wait, what? We're going to do what? Against that army? Because remember, everybody's fear. And you have one million people in yours. And suddenly, Jehoshaphat sends out the marching band. Who in their right mind would do that? Why would he do that? And then it dawned on me. Jehoshaphat truly believed something. He didn't just say it. He didn't just state it. His functional theology matched his stated theology, and he believed this. He believed God's for us. 
He didn't just say it to people. He believed it so much so that when the battle was coming up, God's force, he said he's got this. Yeah, don't even worry about sending the army. Just send in the band because it's over. He was a man of deep conviction and faith and did something incredible because he believed something down deep in his heart. Our God is for us. And if you would take this belief and this thought, in this culture at this time, and all the other gods that existed people would worship, all the other gods were petty, they were distant, they were angry, you never knew what side you stood on, and suddenly there's this king saying, no, our God, he is for us. And he doesn't just say it, he truly believes it. Because when there's an army at his gates, he sends out the band saying, it's over, God said he had it, and our God is for us. Pretty remarkable, isn't it? Remarkable belief. And it led me to this simple question. I started to ask myself, and the question is really simple. Do you believe that God is for us? Do I? That God wants to bless me? That God wants to see me succeed? That God wants to see me become even more than I am right now? That God wants me to thrive and shine? That God is for us? It's, it's an idea found throughout Scripture. You can see it all the way from Abraham talking about it to, to even Paul saying, if God is for us, who can be against us? Our God is for us so much he came to, to earth as a human being and he died on the cross for our sins. Do we believe God is for us? See, for some people... This idea God is for us, they've been around religious institutions and people, and their image and thought of God is one who is against. I mean, when you think about God, what image comes to your mind? Is it a God who's there trying to cheer you on, saying you can be even more? Or is it a God who is distant, who's wagging his finger, who's disappointed, who you never know how you stand with that person? For some people, the message they've heard about God has just been this God is against X, Y, and Z over and over. Or the church that they've been part of, the religious institutions, has been of one a God against. I mean, when people hear the word Christians, do they say, oh, those group of people, they're really for everybody? No, not often. No. So for a lot of people, this idea that God being for us has been replaced with a God against. And when that happens, what happens to your faith is it becomes very dogmatic. It becomes very rigid. You never know where you stand with God. You never know if you've done enough. As if God in some way is keeping score. God works on some sort of merit system, so you always have to try to do more. I've heard thousands of people, I literally, talk to me before to say, if I could just be more holy, if I could just pray more, whatever it may be. And it's like, no, 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 no. God doesn't work that way. He's for you. And for others, maybe it isn't a message of God against. Maybe you're able to say God is for us, but there's a lot of people who truly don't believe that. Because to believe that, you have to be completely vulnerable and honest. I sat with an addict in my office once, and she struggled with alcohol and drank. And she tried to cover it and say she could control it. And we were talking about her life, and she said that the time and how I eventually came to control my disease was when I admitted I couldn't, that my life was out of control. It says only then and there I could be that honest with myself and other people is that I could take steps to actually get it under control and get help. And she said what was really interesting was it was then and there when I was that brutal, honest with everyone is where I found that God truly did love me because he was still there caring for me and I hadn't done anything. I was a mess. I was broken. And I discovered God loved me, not because I'd done anything, but just because I was his child. See, to to say God is for us is one thing, but to, to actually live like it requires a degree of honesty. Because I realized that I spent a lot of time posturing, trying to look like I have it together, trying to control and show other people I'm fine, I'm good, But the truth is, we live in a culture, too, that expects us to have things together. It's not comfortable to be that brutal and honest that you're broken, that you have issues, that you have struggles, that you don't always have it together. And when we're able to actually admit that in the midst of that culture, that is where we begin to discover a God who truly loves. 
not because we have done anything at all. It's because in the midst of that brokenness, we discover what grace really means. That we have a God who is for us, who loves us, just because we're his child. And even though I'm broke and I haven't done these things, he's still there, loving me. And so for some people, this idea, they can say God is for us, but it's difficult to live that out because it's difficult to be that honest. And so for them, their faith is one that they may speak and say things, but down deep, they don't really believe it. And when tough times hit and when difficult things hit, they try to blame God, they get angry, or they get nervous and they live in fear and anxiety because they don't really believe what they state because they won't be that vulnerable and honest with themselves and with God. It requires a massive shift to believe this. And this is what King Jehoshaphat does. He's brutally honest with all of the nation, this most powerful man in the world at this time, I would argue, where everyone's paying tribute. He calls them all together and he says, we need to fast. I can't do this. It's in the midst of that (laughs) <laughs> then that they hear God speak and they truly trust. And it's in the midst of that they see and begin to understand the entire nation that a God is for them. Because the story ends in a, a remarkable way. If you would read it, they go out to meet the army at the pass of Ziz. And when they get there, God sets an ambush and all these nations start fighting each other. And they kill each other. And they, the Israelites, don't even have to fight. They win the war. Now imagine with me for a second, you're this melodica player walking back. And you see the king. And he says, see, I told you. God's for us. Think of how different your faith would be from that point forward. How any problem, any struggle isn't really one because you believe down deep God is for us. Think of how daring you would be for God. Think of anything that goes forward, the advice and the things you would tell other people who are struggling. No, 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 that's not how it works. We have a God for us. Think about how you would understand and see and talk with God. He's not distant. He's not wagging his his fingers. He's for me. I know this. I've seen it. I was humble enough. And see, the story of King Jehoshaphat is a beautiful story because it's a story that tells us we serve a God was for us in every single way. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are thankful that you're for us. You're a loving and caring God that you want to see us succeed. You want to bless us. You want to see us grow. You want to see our families and our churches and our blessed, uh, be blessed and, and to take more for your kingdom. For those in here who struggle to see God for us, we pray that you show them your love in a real tangible way. For those who may say it but struggle to believe it, we pray you give them honesty and strength to believe that. We thank you for the message of King Jehoshaphat, a man with a unique name who does an amazing thing to teach us. You are a God from the very beginning who has cared and who is a God that is loving and who is a God that is for each and every one of us because we're your children. In Christ's name, we all say, amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now, and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.